So I want to thank everyone for joining us today for our Making Multi-Generational Living a Success for Your Family. Our presenters, attorney Kathleen Summers and Phil Summers, will be talking about the specifics of having aging parents and adult children living together under the same roof for reasons, just like most everything, vary for every family. Uh, most of you know both Kathleen and Phil. Uh, they're Generations Law Group's founding partners, and they're also married partners for over 30 years. Kathleen is a nurse attorney who has over 25 years experience helping families navigate the ever-changing field of health, healthy and safe aging. Kathleen advises families every day in making thoughtful choices for themselves and their loved ones. Phil is an attorney who is our probate expert. He is sensitively and competently guides families through administering the estate of a deceased loved one. Phil wears many other hats in our firms and as managing partner, he helps keep our office running smoothly so our team can assist our clients as efficiently as possible. So I join everybody in welcome, welcoming Phil and Kathleen and I'll have you both take it over from here. Wonderful. Well, again, thank you all. Um, thanks, Carol, for the introduction and thank everyone for joining us today. I'm going to go ahead and switch it over so we can share the presentation with everyone. Um, this is a really interesting topic, the idea of multi-generational living and trying to make it a success for um, you and your family, if it's something that you're considering or if you work with clients who are considering um, this type of living arrangement. There are lots of reasons why multifamily um, living has really been on the rise recently. This is just a, a slide we provided with some background, just some statistics about how multifamily um, or multi-generational family living has really been increasing here in the U.S. And that's for many reasons. And I'm going to go through today, Phil and I, with the presentation talking about the reasons behind the increase. Um, the pros and the cons of uh, multi-family uh, or multi-generational family living. And then um, we're also going to talk about legal considerations and other considerations that um, you really should look at when you're considering whether this is right for you and or your family. So a couple of things to realize is that it has been on the increase, not only for the younger generation, who we call the boomerang group coming back again, but also those who are age 55 to 64, we're really seeing an increase in the number of people who are in multi-generational families. There's a lot of reasons for this increase. One of them is raising children. Um, as you all know, you know uh, our, our adult children who are raising their own children um, are finding it more expensive, trying to afford a house in particularly this area of the country and trying to afford things like childcare, being able to make sure that the needs of the family are being met are becoming more and more difficult. The other side of it is caring for the elderly generation as our parents age, thinking about ways to be able to help them age successfully. And one of the ways of doing so is to create a multi-generational um, living arrangement in which uh, parents are able to now enter back into the family um, from a living standpoint and, and help to meet their needs um, as they continue to age. Longer life expectancy among this group um, has really uh, played a key role you know, probably 50 years ago when you retired at 65, you were looking at a life expectancy of a little over 10 to 15 years. Now you're looking at a life expectancy of more than 20. And so that's a huge difference um, in terms of the planning aspect of things for people as they age. When we're dealing with single parents, uh, people who are um, raising children on their own for a multitude of reasons, having the extra support system within the living um, environment can be extremely helpful. And then of course, there's social reasons to have the multi-generational living arrangement, making sure that people are staying engaged, that they have a social outlets, people around them to be uh, communicating <laughs> with, sharing with, and then of course, the financial reasons, um, trying to uh, save money on all ends from again, the childcare perspective, 
the actual living costs and uh, the caring as someone gets older and helping to make the monies that someone may have saved over their lifetime last longer as they go through the aging process. So now I really want to look at kind of the, the joys, the upsides of this type of living arrangement, and we'll talk about some of the things that need to be thought about, the pitfalls in terms of, of these kinds of living arrangements. Um, so first of all, one of the things we've seen in society today is that the stigma of living with your parents after you have finished either your primary or secondary educational course um, is really subsiding more and more. 20-year-olds uh, are living with their parents longer. Part of it is because, again, the, the cost of living in this area is so high, um, and oftentimes they have student loans, et cetera, and so we're seeing young adults, even into their early 30s, still living with their parents. The caregiving aspect of things, and so on both ends of the spectrum, in which you know, you're looking to have either someone to help care for younger children, um, as they're being raised, or the caring aspect for adults um, and seniors as they're um, aging has been uh, helped to be addressed through this kind of, of living arrangement in which um, caregiving can be a part of one of the big benefits for people. Um, forming and strengthening bonds among the family. Uh, you know, generational living is a great way of really being able to develop strong bonds among the generations. There's studies out there that show that, you know, grandchildren who are raised in households in which their grandparents are very active are um, more content, that they oftentimes do better in school, that they have more empathy, um, that they really do benefit from that long-term um, generational living situation. And then, of course, the financial piece again. Um, helping your younger kids to pay off their student loans if they have them, stretching that budget of the retirement for um, the elders in the household and, and helping to share the overall expenses of living in this area can really be beneficial to everyone. But as with everything, there's always downsides or issues that you really need to think about um, when you're thinking about whether a multi-generational living arrangement is gonna work for you. And one of the big ones is, is just overall tension. Um, one of the things that Phil and I talk a lot about with clients um, is the idea that you really do need to be clear about what this living arrangement is going to look like, what the expectations are. When you fail to be clear, it really is um, an open door for tensions to create and simmering issues or issues to really simmer under the surface that can explode at some point. Unfortunately, as attorneys, you know, we oftentimes see when these situations have imploded or are in the process of imploding. And so when families plan ahead, and think about these issues ahead of time, it really can help. How are you gonna deal with tensions when they arise? When people have differing thoughts about how something should be taken care of or managed? How are you gonna um, handle all of the changes in expectations and whether people are meeting those expectations? And so you have to be careful about tensions rising. You also have to be really careful about the unfair balance um, of the burdens that may come with caregiving. So if yours is a situation in which you have young children um, and you also have aging parents and the adult children all in one household, and one of the expectations is that the grandparents will help to take care of the grandchildren, you need to be careful that as those situations evolve that the burden doesn't become too much. Or vice versa, if your aging parents are living with you and you are there expecting to help them out and to be able to provide them with support, what happens as their needs continue to grow? Um, and let's say they have some kind of major health event and now you're in the situation in which you're providing a level of care that you hadn't anticipated, such as personal care for the person. Are you gonna be able to do that? Is that part of what was the expectations to begin with? There's also the issue of, of whether finances are being uh, fairly shared. You know, you end up with someone who is feeling like they're putting more money to the groceries 
They're paying more of the electric cost. They're paying for the cable television and not really using it. These things can become big issues if you haven't talked them through and thought about them ahead of time. And we really have to deal with caregiver burnout. When a caregiver, someone in a caregiving situation, whether it be, again, older generation caring for the younger generation or vice versa, younger generation caring for the older generation, have to be careful of that issue of burnout. And how do you help to make sure that that doesn't occur? Or at least that there is some kind of a backup plan to be able to address those issues should they start to arise. One of the things that we see with particularly the younger generation who may be staying uh, with mom and dad for a period of time or with their grandparents is the failure to launch. And how do you help to avoid that from happening? Um, making sure that you balance the needs of the child both from a dependent standpoint and the need to help them become independent in their living situation and to be able to begin to take on responsibilities for themselves. The last two, too many opinions. One of the things that we see is this is both an internal situation for the multi-generational living environment as well as an external one. The people within the living situation maybe have too many opinions in the sense that uh, maybe the, uh, uh, the grandparents don't really agree with how the parents are raising their children. Or maybe the children, the adult children, are not too happy with how the grandparents are interacting with the young children. These things have to be uh, considered um, in terms of people's opinions within how what's right, what's wrong, and how those things get decided and who's responsible. The other aspect of the opinions is those outside. Maybe you are only one of one adult child of this a senior couple and you have siblings who are beginning to uh, voice their opinions about what should be happening. Do their opinions hold weight? How do you go about involving them if they're not part of the actual living environment day to day? And so these things have to be considered as well. And then the issue of loss of privacy. Um, you've got multiple generations living within one, uh, usually a confined area. How do you make sure that privacy is protected for all concerned? Um, and so thinking about these issues ahead of time and making them part of the plan, addressing both the positive side of living together and the potential issues that may arise before they happen can really go a long way in making you successful with this type of an arrangement. And of course, we can't go on with any conversation these days without considering the additional stressors that the current environment is adding. And certainly it's adding to the multi-generational um, family arrangement as well, and that's really COVID-19. It's added a whole new layer. The issue of transmission of infection Certainly that was always there when you're dealing with people in multiple generations and having to potentially deal with vulnerable populations such as the extreme elders or those who are very young. But with this COVID-19 um, occurrence, it has really heightened that worry about transmitting infection. So how do you go about making sure that all the members of the family unit understand how they are affecting others and how their actions both inside the home and outside the home may affect each other and potentially risk health. Um, I have to really talk about who are the vulnerable health, uh, the members of the family. And again, with COVID-19, it's not clear. And so how do we go about protecting all of the members from potential um, exposure to this illness? Coming up with things like good cleaning routines, do you take your shoes off when you come in the house every day? Do you have to make sure that, you know, certain items are cleaned every day, countertops, door handles, all of that? Who's going to be responsible for it? And how do you make sure that all the family members are following the routine? And then you also want to make sure you have a plan in place to isolate if necessary. And this is certainly if someone becomes ill within the family unit, how do you make sure that they're properly isolated from the others? 
or if someone is unduly exposed in one area, how do you make sure that there's a way to isolate them um, as much as possible from the other members of the family while they're ensuring that um, their own health is being taken care of. So COVID-19 has just added to stressors that were already there for these types of living situations and really heightened the concern and the need to make sure that you're talking about how you're gonna go about addressing them. So Phil, do you wanna talk about really what to do or what to be looking at before people uh, move in and enter these kinds of relationships? Sure. Uh, thank you, Kathleen, and uh, welcome everyone to our webinar. So the first thing I, you know, I suggest to clients is, the first step is really do a feasibility analysis. And what I mean that you do it on a number of different levels. First of all, uh, you know, do you have the chemistry to live with your adult child? Um, you know, if you did not get along with your daughter or son when they lived in your home, how are things going to change when the situation is reversed? Will you be able to make that work? Are there kind of flashpoints in your relationship that might carry into a living uh, you know, situation? Um, included in that feasibility is the house. Uh, you know, is it one level living? Is that important? Is your privacy important? Do you want a separate area to live in uh, that you want to be able to go in there and kind of be off duty or kind of punch out <laughs> in terms of family time? Uh, is that acceptable? Um, if the current uh, home isn't uh, the right setup, can you expand it or put an in-law apartment? You need to take a look at the town bylaws uh, to see if, uh, if that's uh, uh, allowable. Um, so these are, you know, you really need to take a look at kind of your MO and will it work in terms of relationship? And don't expect because your child lived with you 20 years ago, things are going to work out again. Financial arrangements is oftentimes the downfall of most relationships. And sometimes it's an uncomfortable topic to talk about. Um, you'll, you'll handle it later. But this is something you really need to discuss up front. Who's going to pay for what? Um, if you're going to have a separate in-law apartment, will be separately metered. How about groceries? <clears throat> will you be paying a portion of groceries? Do you have special dietary needs? Uh, how about electricity? utilities, cable, how are these things going to be shared? And, and we recommend, and uh, you know, in bold we put in the bottom is, put this in a kind of what we call a living contract. Um, you don't need an attorney to do this, but kind of set down the expectations of who's doing what. Also household duties. You know, is it the expectation that you'll be contributing to the household or will it be something we brought in to help things out? And also, what about care expectations? Let me give you an example. We had a client <clears throat> who moved in with her daughter, and within two years, she had a, a dementia diagnosis, uh, which progressed very, very quickly. Uh, it was kind of a surprise to all parties, but her care requirements substantially increased. Who's gonna take care of her? Do you bring uh, people in? Is the adult child gonna provide care? If the adult child provides care, is there going to be in, you know, a, a payment or a transfer in terms of inheritance? These are the things you have to think about, uh, especially if your adult children are working full time and they have their own children. So it gets very challenging. And that's, that's the reason why they call the adult children the sandwich generation, because they have uh, challenges of both parents and also their own children. So uh, you need to kind of think through should the, the grandparents' health declines, how is that, how those services are going to be brought in and who's going to pay for them? So things you need to think about. And the other thing we, uh, we talk, we, you should think about is boundary lines. Uh, is your privacy important? Um, when or when or not, uh, you know, can the you know, grandchildren barge into your room or your apartment? You know, is there a certain way you like things done? I mean, do you like the uh, you know, uh, do you like to watch TV at night and like to do it by yourself or read, uh, or you're sociable. I mean, think about your own lifestyle and how that will work uh, with your family. But as you said, if you can discuss these ahead of time, kind of do an analysis of what's important to you, but also write it in a contract or at least write it down. So if there's any questions down the road or you know misunderstandings, this is hopefully you'll resolve it 
in advance. So if you can go to the next one, Kathy. So let's talk about some of the uh, legal issues you should really, uh, you know, you need to kind of comprehend as you go into this arrangement. First of all, as we discussed, if you are gonna make modifications to the home, for example, adding on an apartment or in-law apartment, um, who's gonna pay for it? Who owns what? Now there's a couple ways you can do that. I mean, certainly uh, the grandparents' name could be put on a title or you can reserve what's called the life estate that as long as the grandparents are alive, they have a right to live in the house. But the tricky things come into play in divorces. So suppose your adult children divorce. How do you preserve or protect the investment you made into that house? Uh, we had a client that uh, put on an in-law apartment for their daughter, also a brand new kitchen, probably two, $300,000 uh, know, investment made in the home. And within three years, the uh, couple was uh, uh, going through a divorce. Unfortunately, um, her name was not on the title or there was an, wasn't any uh, life estate reserved for her. So that, her improvements became part of the marital property and she unfortunately did not get anything. Uh, you know, her uh, investment was not returned to her when the house had to be sold. Um, Kathy, I'm going to have you talk about the gifting and a future mass health qualification. Sure. And I just want to add to that too. We've had another situation in which um, the, uh, the um, uh, seniors in this case had actually put on an in-law apartment onto um, their uh, child's home. There were other children as well involved. Again, as Phil said, it was a substantial investment. It was a conversation that the family did have ahead of time that this one child was actually benefiting more potentially than the others in exchange for certain expectations around care. The one thing that didn't happen though was, a, was clarity about what those expectations were. And so as the parents began to age and their needs began to increase in terms of day-to-day -day care, the pressure that was put on the daughter and her family who were the ones who had taken them in and put on the in-law apartment began to grow. And again, this particular case, as Phil said, this is a different one, but ended up in divorce. And um, what was now gonna happen? How were they going to go about um, making sure that um, the mom and dad were either reimbursed or somehow uh, compensated for their for the monies they put in, or potentially they were gonna lose all of that investment and it was not gonna be something they were gonna recoup against. And so um, these issues do become real. Uh, what happens if the child who you have invested in in terms of the living arrangement passes away? Uh, what happens to then um, the older generation and are they gonna to continue to live with their uh, in-law? Are they going to stay in that environment? How do people get compensated? Um, the other issue is when we think about Medicaid planning. So Medicaid or MassHealth here in Massachusetts is oftentimes uh, the payer source, the insurance source that we go to when someone ages and needs long-term care or nursing home placement. Well, gifting of monies when you give away your assets within a five-year time frame prior to applying for any kind of state assistance can cause ineligibility. And so if you give your child money to be able to put that in-law apartment on the house and you don't get anything back, and so when we talk about what you get back, maybe again, as Phil said, that's ownership in some way in the property or a life estate in the property. Maybe we can argue it's the care level that you're getting while living there in that apartment. But we have to be very careful about how this transfer of monies occur. One of the best ways to always do it is to make sure that if you are the elder who is putting on the improvement or putting on the uh, um, apartment, the in-law area on the home, that you actually pay for those services directly as opposed to even reimbursing your child or giving money to your child to do so. Because it can make the difference between arguing a gift to a child 
and utilizing or benefiting from some service that you've paid for directly. So speaking with an elder law attorney about what your desires are before him and really working with them to do a full assessment of what's happening in the overall situation and how different arrangements may affect your eligibility in the future is important. Because one of the downsides of having ownership in the property is that that, that that property is considered an asset of yours if you do need to apply for assistance. So there are many ways to kind of slice this and make it happen. You just need to think those through with a professional and be sure that you are comfortable in understanding both the pros and the cons of the different arrangements that you can make. Um, let me just pick it up from there, Kathy. So we also often have clients come to us and say, well, one of my adult children is going to, you know, I want even the scales in life. I have three children. One of my children will be take care of me, allow me to live in their home. How can I kind of make up for that? In in, there's really several different options. You can give a, you know, disparate inheritance. So maybe the adult child who's taking care of you or living in your, allowing you to live in their home. Maybe they get an uneven share. Um, also, if your adult child is giving up a career for your care, that's something you need to be considered. Maybe there's a payment. Maybe there's other uh, items you can do. We've had clients buy a life insurance policy and make the uh, adult child the beneficiary. So when uh, your passing or the passing does occur, uh, that child, uh, you know, the scales are even for all the contributions they made in terms of your care, living, and other support. So things you should think about, but there are avenues from a legal perspective to kind of carve out a greater share or a greater portion for that adult child. And it, then the other thing you really need to think about, Kathy, do you want to add something there? I, did. I just wanted to say too that sometimes it's the other way around. So you have three children, let's say, you've got one of them who you, um, you know, you're moving in with, you're helping them out with their children, you've given them some money ahead of time to help make some improvements in their home to give a living space for you. How do you make sure that your other children receive an equal or at least a, a composite, you know, a composite, some kind of uh, benefit from let's say your estate and, 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 uh, after you've passed away? And so thinking about that overall picture, Remember, you have the right to go ahead and divide up your estate any way you want. If you want to give one child more of a share than the others, you can do so. But if that is not your ultimate goal, then you have to think about how other assets that you may have could benefit the other children. Things like Phil said, purchase of a life insurance policy may actually then take care of the other children as opposed to the child who you've given money to now. Um, or possibly a larger share of the remainders of your retirement plans, those kinds of things. So you want to have someone really sit down and go through with you the overall picture and how that will affect um, your family as a whole. Because one of the things that always happens, and, and Phil can talk about it from a probate standpoint, after someone passes away, you are no longer there to explain why you did something, how you did it. And if keeping family relations is important, you don't want to make it so that there is festering resentment between the siblings after you're gone. And so thinking again about these things ahead of time, making sure you have a clear plan as to how things will play out so that family relations are maintained wherever we can. The uh, last item uh, I'd like to talk about, and this is one of the things that uh, I'd say uh, most clients do not consider or think about ahead of time, is what happens if things don't work out? We always want to look at the positive. It's, you know, it's kind of uh, exciting to be able to live your daughter, be closer to the grandchildren, but sometimes it doesn't work out. And that's when really the problems occur. Always a lot better to kind of plan the exit strategy or at least kind of uh, put some ideas down ahead of time before you even move. If you made an investment in the house, how does that come out? If you need nursing home or a higher level of care, 
how do you get your equity out of the home? If you, again, if you've uh, contributed quite a few dollars, um, you need to kind of think about that, you know, if, you know, it is for your protection, your benefit, but you may need that money back. If you don't need it, that's another different story, but you know, how do you kind of leave, uh, I, I guess the home, but also try to keep the family relationship intact. And that's often tricky, very tricky, but if you kind of spell up ahead of time, you know, a little bit of planning ahead of time certainly can uh, alleviate many problems on the back end. Um, and I was, my apologies. I was going to say we had a, a client who um, had actually put on an in-law apartment onto um, their son's home and th they were healthy, um, doing fine at the time. And they did a lot to help raise uh, their grandchildren and to really, they were there for them. And it was a wonderful, wonderful situation. The grandchildren all went off uh, on their own, began to you know, disperse and be launched. And now the daughter or the daughter-in-law and the son really wanted to think about downsizing and no longer being in the area that they were living but they had made this commitment to his parents. And so thinking about, this wasn't even a health crisis situation, although the parents were certainly getting older and the idea of moving for them became less and less appealing. And so how do you make it so that even in a situation in which you're not dealing with a healthcare crisis, but you're dealing with a just a natural life event in which now we see the the adult children have grown and on their own and the um adult parents are wanting to stay where they are while the son and the daughter-in-law are thinking about next steps so thinking about these things ahead of time because even if there isn't a crisis that occurs life changes as we all know as time goes on the needs of everyone will change as time goes on and the more that you can think about the different scenarios that you may be facing and what the strategy would be to try to make it so that everyone is able to part possibly in this situation and be as whole as possible is considered so that people are able to move forward and the relationship between the people can be preserved. Uh, here, advance to the next slide, please, Kathy. We talked a little bit about the home, but we want to give you a couple other things you may want to think about in addition to the kind of the legal issues. Uh, the home, remember, you may be, you know, uh, the, the current set may be fine now, but if you're, as your health declines, is the home sufficiently set up as you age in place? Is it one floor limit? Do you have a lot of stairs, a lot of thresholds, things that make it difficult to navigate? Uh, you know, again, you need to think years in, in, in down the road as your health and mobility declines. Um, we talked about privacy to the people. That's very important. Uh, but how is the house set up? You know, is the peace and solitude important to you? Uh, and also accessibility, you know, in, in terms of uh, movement, getting in and out of the house, you know, you know is that going to be uh, acceptable? And, you know, as your needs change, is the house set up for that? Um, the other thing I like to talk about is again, you know, I know we've mentioned it before, is really kind of the caregiving role because that seems to be a significant stress point among families, particularly as if you, ha if you have a health event or as your your uh, you know your your health declines, who's going to provide care for you? And also, is which typically uh, studies show that 70% of the caregivers are the, uh, the adult daughter, um, and the uh, you know they have their own children, they have their own career. You know, how do you, how does the adult child uh, handle the stress? I mean, are they compensated? But also, you know, are other uh, uh, professionals will they be brought in to assist in the household to take care of the stress? Are there other adult children who live nearby? So if you can plan out your needs and anticipate down the road, although we all can't perfectly um, anticipate, uh, to think of, think it through. The what ifs. What would happen if uh, I broke a hip and I need to, you know, you know, I can't get around. Um, it often leads to a significant uh, stress. Uh, also, caregivers. I mean, 
again, as you age, your needs will change. Would your son or daughter be comfortable to handling your daily needs, such as bathing or using the toilet, stuff like that? That could be very uncomfortable, something to think about how that would be handled. Right. Uh, and then obviously, we, you know, money, you know, whichever option you uh, pick, uh, it kind of flows, you know, you know, in terms of the help you need to bring in. If money's been set aside to make sure if care is going to be brought into the home, it has money been set aside, who's going to pay for it? One um, of, if I could, Phil, just adding to that, a um, couple of the scenarios that we've seen is that you oftentimes have one child, the child who is part of the multi-generational living environment, who is also bearing the burden of a lot of the day-to-day day care as the care needs increase. And if there are other children, other members of the family who may not be living in that environment, are there ways for them to be able to help relieve the sum of the burden? Should they be compensated? Because they, of course, aren't getting the benefit of having their parent live with them and, and share the expenses, possibly. So how do you make sure that you're sharing, when possible, the overall um, responsibilities of care. And one of the other things we've seen is that as the senior, as the older person, being open to having outside caregivers come in because sometimes the solution is to be able to pay for someone to come in to help do lighthouse cleaning in the house, to do the personal care that Phil was talking about, um, to allow your children to be in the role of your children still and not to be in that role of personal caregiving and having to really bear the burden of that personal care provision um, all on their own. And so part of it is also as, as we age and as our needs change, keeping open to accepting help in different ways and potentially from different people in order to make sure that it's successful. And as the caregiving child, you also have to be recognizing that you can't do it all, that you need assistance at certain points, and that accepting that assistance isn't a failure. And thinking again, as Phil talked about, how do you financially um, obtain that assistance? Because it usually is at an additional cost to be making sure that you're not getting burnt out as a caregiver. And as you work through this relationship, you know, keep in mind communication you know, is so important. If the problems do occur, communicate back what your expectations are or if there are issues, you don't want to let them fester. But communication could be a double-edged sword. Uh, if you are a person who does not approve of your daughter's parenting style, can you bite your tongue? Can you not bring up a uh, correct your daughter because uh, sometimes that's not well received. And remember, uh, you're not the parent in the house. Your adult child is. So sometimes, there's, for some people, that may be very difficult. So consider, um, you know, if you're a person who cannot hold back and the problems that may um, cause. Um, Multi-generational living could be a great experience. Some, you know, oftentimes it's wonderful for a grandparent to get to know their grandchildren on a, on a different level. And really be part of their uh, our life. I mean, living uh, with your children gives you connections. It gives you uh, a reason to live. It gives you more activity. Um, you know, so there's a lot of benefits. I think as attorneys, we see the downsides. <laughs> we see the problems, but for every downside, there's so many wonderful experiences and uh, most families have found it a really joyful time. But with a little planning ahead of time and anticipating, you can make it a success and not a horrific life altering, <laughs> you know, disruptive of a family relationship. So some ideas just to kind of think through as you kind of plan this out. Um, and I think, and I, okay. and I think, well, and I think too, remembering that the reasons that you went into this situation or want to go into this situation, remembering that um, it, the benefits of being together as a family, the fact that you know, hopefully you enjoy your time with each other as a family, that those things you don't want to lose as you're going into this kind of relationship. It really can be an incredibly positive experience for everyone. You just need to have clarity about things 
an ability to openly communicate and adjust the plan if you need to as time goes on in order to make sure that everyone is clear about their expectations and how those expectations are going to be met. Um, and if you are able to do that, then you are more than, you know, halfway there in terms of success for this kind of living arrangement, because it really can be beneficial to all if you go in with your eyes wide open and with a clear conversation beforehand. All right. I think uh, we've talked for quite a bit for almost 45 minutes. Let's, if we have any questions from anyone, I don't know if Carol wants to join in and she, is, she has any questions. So uh, uh, we certainly enjoyed it. Uh, but obviously want to hear your uh, questions. If you have anything you'd like a little more clarification on. So I have not had any questions come in through the chat box, but I'm going to ask folks to unmute themselves. Um, and if you have a question, feel free to speak up. And um, Hello? Question. Hello. Hi. Hi, I have a question. Sure. Um, I am 35. I have two children. My mom watches them while my husband and I work. We live in her house where I lived when I was in high school, but my mom actually lives in my brother's house in an in-law apartment, which is the house we grew up in before I was in high school. Um, so we pay my mom rent and we also pay her like very little next to nothing for watching our kids all week long. Um, and I'm wondering, so we've, we've come up with one snafu, like I really want to get renter's insurance, but my rental company says she has to change her homeowner's insurance to be more expensive in order for me to get renter's insurance. And it's better if we just say she lives with us. And I'm really a very uh, honest person. Like, I don't like the idea of saying she lives with us, even though she does live with us four days a week. Right. So that's one thing we've come against. Um, but also just wondering, you, keep, you guys keep uh, referring to having a contract we've never written down anything about this it just kind of happened you know we were renting her house before we got married and then we got married and then we had children and then she started watching the children and then she asked us for pay when we had a second child you know what I mean like this kind of happened there really hasn't been a contract and then when things change like when COVID happened we decided to pay her more and we just changed it so we've never written any of it down is that bad <laughs> well so, so good for you all. I mean, I, that's wonderful that you've been able to find a way to make this work. It sounds like you've got, you know, people who are willing and, and able to adjust as time goes on and who are really amicable about it all. The, the thing is, is that, you know, very much like a business relationship, when things are working well, it works beautifully. It's wonderful. The problem is, is when things change. And so what happens when the children get older and don't need as much care, let's say, and she's providing a certain level of care now? What if, would she be expecting more rent for the property? Are you all able to afford more rent? What happens if something happens to her and God forbid she has an illness or an accident and can't provide the kids with care? What do you guys do then? Are you gonna be able to afford to stay in the house? How then will you shift things? So there's a couple of ways of looking at it. One is you could continue the way you are and just adjusting as time goes by, but the longer you continue with this relationship, the more possibilities that your expectations and your mom's expectations, your brother's expectations may not line up. Um, you know, again, God forbid, something happens to you, something happens to your marriage. So having, do you have to have it all in writing? We always like to see that just because as lawyers, it gives us something to go to in case there's an issue. But at least having these conversations is what's important, that you've had an open source of communication to talk about how are we going to handle this? What happens now? Are you and your brother doing okay in terms of how you're both being kind of treated um, by mom and, and what benefits uh, uh, each of you are getting and what burdens each of you has? That's where it's important and having conversation is extremely, that's critical. Having it in writing, sure, I'd love to see you have some kind of parameters around things. But that's not as critical as having open conversations about how you're going to handle things. Does that Thank help? you. Yeah, 
I think so. I always wonder, like I said, I like, I like having things official. So I always wonder if we should have writing down the arrangement with her. You know, well, I'm a private care manager, so I think about what's going to happen when she needs care, my brother. Right. And I'm sorry, we lost you a little bit there. But you are going to take care of them as well. Very cool with that. She has four children and she's had no complaints about the fact that all of us want her raising our kids. But remember, as she gets older, marriages are between the houses. We're very lucky that we have that opportunity. Um, so I just don't know, you know, maybe we should write it. It's something to think about. So thank you guys for that. Absolutely. And as she gets older, one of the things that we need to be concerned about is if she did need a higher level of care, and how would she pay for that? Where is her care needs going to be met? Or how are her care needs going to be met? And the financial arrangements can make a big difference. Um, and having those in writing do become more critical as she becomes older. Yeah. Also, is, should it, you, you and your husband, you or your husband, you know, get a job outside the area, you have to move. What does that look like? What, where, where's your mom? What happens to your mom? Does she move with you? Does she stay in the area? Is that where her family and friends are, are located? So while you can't anticipate every, any, everything, it's kind of a good idea to kind of talk about some of the big stuff that we've kind of got through this presentation of kind of what ifs. You know, if things have to, you know, if you have to kind of break things up and there's an exit strategy, there's some, some things just to think about. Well, thank you all. And um, it was wonderful to have everybody on. I hope this was helpful to you. We hope that you got something out of it. And um, just remember, we are here if there are questions or concerns that arise. Yeah, yeah. thank you for everyone for joining us.